Hello and welcome to episode 420 of the Thinking LSAT podcast. I'm Ben Olson. With me is Nathan Fox. We're the co-founders of LSATdemon.com and the LSAT Demon Daily podcast. You can be LSAT famous by sharing news and asking questions on our website. That's thinkinglsat.com. If you took the LSAT at an in-person testing center, we want to hear from you. We want to know about your experience. That's kind of a new thing. How did it go? What did you think? Would you recommend it to somebody else? Oh, <laughs> this is news to me. Apparently on Monday, October 9th, I am doing a free class. That's 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I don't even know what I'm discussing in that class. Actually, I just clicked on the link. It looks like logical reasoning. So yeah, if you're struggling at all with logical reasoning, come to that class. You can sign up for it at lsat.link forward slash free. What we do is we do actual LSAT questions in class, and then I walk through them and talk you through how you should be thinking about the question, the answer choices, before you even read the question. So I'm reading the passage or the argument, I'm breaking it down. That's where 80, 90% of the work takes place. And uh, the point of that class is to show you how to do that. I guess I want to point out here that that's it's Ben, that's your just normal Monday class, right? You didn't even it's like nothing, nothing special, nothing different. It's like actually <laughs> yeah. our product. And yeah. that's on Monday, October 9th, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. It's just Ben's class for free. So if you want to go to Ben's class, check out what we have to offer at LSAT Demon. You should definitely do that. Yeah, please come. Today, we have two special guests, uh, Kate Bridal and Josie Hoff of the Legal Burnouts podcast. Thank you both for joining us. One of you is in D.C., no? I was in D.C. Oh, you were in D.C. D.C. Oh, yeah. okay. Where are you now, Josie? Seattle. Yeah. Seattle. Okay. After, after the pandemic, I had to get somewhere with a little bit more space to roam. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about you because you're in the D.C. area, right? Right. Yeah. I'm just outside yeah. about 25 minutes outside. I'm in Vienna. So, OK, that's a little better. Being stuck in the middle of D.C. during the pandemic was not my favorite. I have to admit. Yeah, I, I, I hear you. I like being outside even just a little bit because I have it just it opens up quite a bit, even just 20 minutes outside of D.C. Kate, where yeah. are you? I guess since we're. uh <laughs> <laughs> I uh, am in Nevada, but like nowhere that anyone knows. Um, we're like up closer to Reno than than Vegas, up like Reno Tahoe area. Okay. Hey, we're we're neighbors. I'm in State Line. Oh my gosh, that's right. Yeah, Eric mentioned that. That's crazy. Yeah, we live like an hour from each other. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Reno is a lot different though. Up here at the lake, <laughs> in the mountains, it's yeah, <laughs> rural, very rural. I get to Reno for my yeah. you know city time. It's great. <laughs> yeah, so do we actually. So yeah. that we're just from another direction. <laughs> cool. So Eric uh, kindly included bios about both of you. Um, you can hear them. This is from. I your don't website. remember sending him one. So this no, is he oh, yeah okay, he he, he took oh. them off the internet. So Kate, you're a <laughs> former attorney, right? And I, I've heard you say yes. multiple times that you don't have much or you didn't have much love for the law or something along those lines, right? Those are your words. <laughs> like ever went to law school without any, yeah, love for the oh, law. Correct. Same. Yes. Yeah. I went to, <laughs> yeah, there you go. That's why we're not in it anymore, right? Um, yeah. I I went in uh, wanting to, well, I bounced around a lot. I had like multiple lives. I went to drama school right out of high school. Then I went and studied primate behavior, worked with chimpanzees who spoke sign language. And then I decided law school was kind of the shortest route into the FBI, which is what I wanted to do at the time. Um, and then that dream <laughs> pretty much went out the window, like I would say beginning of my 2L year um, for multiple reasons. And then it sort of was like, uh oh, I have to be a lawyer now. Um, and obviously that didn't work out, but <laughs> I did for a brief period of time practice as an attorney. Wow. And so you went to Cornell, right? Um, and yeah, so I did my first year in Boulder, actually, and then I transferred oh, okay. to Cornell. So, yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. cool. And you graduated in 2018. And then how long did you practice after? Because you said you didn't like it, but you... <laughs> Only about two years. So I actually had a weird kind of delay as well after because my husband went into the military while I was in law school. So then we didn't know where we were going to live after I graduated. Um, 
And so it was kind of one of a couple of states, uh, none of which, of course, had the multi-state bar exam. <laughs> um, and so I was like, I'm not taking multiple bars. Uh, so I just wound up, thankfully, my professors who I had worked with at the uh, death penalty defense clinic at Cornell just gave me a job as a, like a remote research assistant for them while I was figuring my life out. Um, and then I... It was a year after I graduated that I took the bar when we finally knew where we were going to be in California. And uh, yeah, so I was a little delayed. And then after that, I worked, I was clerking at the public defender's office there. And then uh, the pandemic hit like fairly soon, a couple of months after I got my bar results. And I was convinced I was going to be laid off. And then also was like, well, I should probably find a job that says attorney because I passed the bar now. <laughs> um, but I really didn't want to go into a courtroom. So that was a struggle. But thankfully, I found this job at a nonprofit doing housing law, which I had never touched a day in my life, um, and sort of uh, disability rights, fair housing, and uh, did that for two years. But I burned out there after about six months. And then just struggled to find anything else and get out of it for two years um, until I got out into tech. Okay, cool. Thanks for sharing. Josie, <laughs> you are a former paralegal. Yeah. You're um, also a former LSAT demon student. We just Guilty. found that out. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. Love to get your feedback on that at some point. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You're a current business development manager in the legal services and tech space. You love the law. So in contrast to Kate, I guess, right? But you mm -hmm. still burned out. So you, is that correct? Correct, yes. Oh, okay, okay. Um, you completed your BA at the University of Montana um, in which you, at, at that time you apparently interned at, at a refugee law clinic in Cape Town, South Africa. Sounds fascinating. As a paralegal, you primarily worked on appellate and Supreme Court cases, including several major abortion bans. After five years of working in law firms and preparing to attend law school, you burned out and transitioned into legal <laughs> services and tech. So, dun, dun, dun. yeah, what you love the law and yet you burned out. What what happened? I don't... Yeah, well, loaded question. Um, I think for anyone that has been able to to practice or be in the law realm before going to law school or even after, um, you learn that what your your idea of what you want to do when you go into law school or what you want to do when you're in law practicing in any form is very different than what how it actually works. You have this kind of idealized version of, you know, fighting for justice and on all of these things that we often the bullshit we feed ourselves. But the reality is it's nothing like that most of the time. And there's a lot of systematic bullshit that keeps us from doing that. So I worked in firms primarily, and I think anyone that's worked in big law or firms knows there's a lot of a lot of egos, a lot of um, just burning the candle at both ends, so to speak. You know, I have slept several times at my office mm. um, trying to get deadlines done. I've been called in the middle of the night, 1130, asked to file something at 12 when I was already asleep. Mm. Yeah. You know, and so on. The list can go on. I, I don't want to bore anyone with the the terrible no, stories. No, tell but, us more, actually. I think know. people love these sort of details. We know that it's like a little challenging out there, but sometimes when you hear yeah. it, right? Like you, you were a paralegal, you were at a big firm, you were home, mm -hmm. you went to bed and someone, a partner or somebody, associate, somebody yeah. called you and said, hey, we got to get this done in the next 30 minutes. So you're yeah. like popping up, doing that. Yeah. Hard usually. to imagine that the quality can be very good on that work at that point. It's you're not. You literally woke up. <laughs> it's <laughs> not. Ahead. Yeah. And From I think Josie, too, it probably was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. She probably was. Oh, too kind, too kind. Um, no, it, it, it's not great. Especially, I think, if you're in the law, you also realize that a lot of people have to take sleep aids because you're so stressed oh. all the time. Mm -hmm. So if you mm -hmm. <laughs> imagine taking a sleep aid and being woken up and you're supposed to somehow make your brain function in a way that's going to file something and not have any sanctions slapped on you. That's what the Ritalin and uh, 
ultra doses of oh. caffeine and oh. cocaine exactly. are for, right? Exactly. Uh, that's right. That's to counteract the ambient. Yeah. <laughs> oh <my> yes. <laughs> you're you're exactly. medicating to go to bed and you're medicating to wake up. Everybody Jeez, thinks yeah. we're joking, but that <laughs> no, is it's kind not of the culture. No, yeah. it's, it's... No, no, seriously. Like, I, I remember yeah. my first... I'm sorry, Josie, you go ahead. I, I was just going to say, it, it does wonders on your stomach to be on all of those things at once. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. No, I, I always say like my first day of law school was basically them begging us not to kill ourselves. Like mm. they they really our orientation was like, listen, guys, we don't know why, um, but you all are about to have a lot of problems with like alcoholism and drug addiction and depression. And by the way, that's in law school and it doesn't go away after law school. Mm. So no, get ready for that and we'll bring in therapy dogs during finals Ugh. but sorry and it was like okay <laughs> see how much we care um, about you <laughs> great no and i mean that school really was like that was at boulder and they were really great and then i got sort of a similar orientation at cornell but you know they they did both do make efforts to be supportive i think um in ways that i've heard other law schools don't but it yeah you red flag right off the bat there a little bit <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah. Sorry, really quick. I, it's interesting. I, I think when I was graduating, I, I had to take an ethics class or something. I don't remember why now. Mm -hmm. But I feel like in that class, that's where I heard this statistic that among white collar jobs, attorneys are the ones who have the struggle with alcoholism the most. I don't know if that's actually yeah. true, but that's yeah. a stat that always stuck with me. Um, Yeah. So people are yeah. trying to basically... There's a lot of stress, right? And you're also just fighting, which is just mm. even if you uh, you're fighting with other people, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I, I I know it's it's a civilized. Yeah. Def, there's a lot of defined Depending rules on the around day. this <laughs> fight. Yeah, sometimes <laughs> it's professional fighting, right? But it, it's still on some deep, I'm sure, primal level. You can't suppress the 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 hormones that are released in any mm -hmm. sort of conflict. So, anyways, sorry. Yeah, that's just yeah, and. I would say too, like when we, we talk about the kind of fighting that can happen and then those things just coming out, it's often not at the clients because you can't, you know, you can't react to a client that way. So the mm -hmm. partner is going to take that or whichever attorney is kind of leading that is going to take that and feed those negative um, reactions down the mm -hmm. line into the people below them. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, associates paralegals are the first to get hit with that but legal assistants as well and and so on and so forth so it does happen that fight does happen it's just directed at the wrong people which leads to further burnout early on in your career so yeah, yeah those are those are things but yeah there's i mean there's several things that make it very challenging to work in law firms and also challenging to work in nonprofit. When I was at the refugee law clinic for that short period of time, and Kate can speak more to nonprofit than I can, but there's just so many levels of burnout. There's emotional burnout that can happen with that. And then on the firm side, there's a lot of just toxic, toxic culture, toxic. Mm -hmm. There's no work-life balance. If you ever think that you're going to go into a firm after law school and have a work-life balance, it's not, it's not going to happen. Even at some of the best firms, you can have a better, get a little closer to that balance than maybe some, but you will not have a, a balance, in my opinion. And so on that happy note, sorry. <laughs> well, a little bit of a shift here, but you say, you say that you loved the law. So what aspects of it did you love? Are, there, are they still there? They're just mixed in with a bunch of things <laughs> you dislike? Yeah, um, I do love it. And I... I still love it. I, I miss a lot of aspects of it in the sense that I enjoy, I enjoyed the study of law. I enjoyed reading those really tedious textbooks. I enjoyed, you know, I don't know if any, maybe your listeners will know, but Iraq, you know, where you're, you're essentially taking a case and you're outlining it. I, I love doing that as well. Kate laughs. So really quick, just to clarify for people, Iraq, okay. I, I'm going to try to remember this. It's a uh, issue... Rule. Rash rule, rule. Uh, analysis and then conclusion. Yeah. Yeah. So wait, you were doing that as a paralegal? I, I did that as a paralegal. I also did that in my undergraduate. So I took I was in pre-law was my second major. And so I was able to take a couple law courses through the law school 
Okay. And um, the purpose of that was really to give us an idea of what being in a a class in law school would would look like, what things are expected, being called on without any preparation, you know, things like that. And so I started doing IRAC at that point in my undergraduate. Um, so just to, just to clarify, it's a writing structure, right? For yeah. writing that when you encounter an issue or a a problem that your client has, and you're you're identifying the issue, the rule that is mm -hmm. going to apply to that, and so on. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you you do that, in a, you know, through a lot of different ways with the law. And you like, like that? That's, a I lot of people it. hate that. Yeah, no, I loved it. I love <laughs> outlines. I function. Okay. My entire life is function on an outline. So never. Um, have we ever related to each other less than when she told me that, that she yeah. found her love of the law through like the <laughs> outlining strategy. I was like, I went into law school, not never outlining anything. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, I don't know. I loved it. But I think that can be part of the problem when we talk about, you know, law school and the LSAT is you can have someone that really loves to study the law that has worked in, you know, major firms for five years and been very close in different cases and helped with all of these different things. So you have this real world experience or this, you know, desire to really actually learn the material because you've worked with it. But there are still so many blockers, finance, you know, student loans and finances is the main one to be able to go to law school and actually, you know, actually get to study and get your GD. So I loved it. I just couldn't, I couldn't I I was tired of trying to battle the system to get to law school, I think, is where it came down to. And I was working in law firms and the culture there really started to weigh on me. So when I thought about, well, I'm really trying hard to get into law school and not have to pay for it, to your point of your, you know, everything you guys do is not having to pay for it. But I was then looking around at the people around me and how miserable everyone was and how miserable I was <laughs> and thinking, so I'm going to, I'm going through all of this. I'm, you know, barely able to get sleep as it is. And yet I'm going to go and make that 10 times worse and also have debt on top of that. Why, why would I do this? You know, I don't know what, you know, if down the line I'll do it, but it's, it was just a, I was done. I was done fucking around with it. So. Sorry, I'm cussing a lot. If you're new to the show, our <laughs> tagline at the end of every show is don't pay for law school. And I mm -hmm. think that, Josie, you're a success story as far as LSAT Demon students are concerned. You studied for the LSAT long enough and you listened to our advice enough to realize that you were going to incur a mountain of debt in order to get into a field that as much as you say you love the law, um, you know, you loved a couple law classes in undergrad, but you didn't love the culture of five years working in an actual law firm. Mm -hmm. And that's the law. I mean, that's yeah. what the that's what your day to day is going to actually be like. So I just I want to say, you know, thank you for giving LSAT Demon a shot. But I also I really do think it's a win when when our students decide, hey, it's not worth it for the price I'm going to have to pay. I'm out of here. And you were making you were it was the price you were going to have to pay financially, but also the price that you were going to have to pay emotionally. And you just decided mm -hmm. to peace out. That's I think is nothing but a win. Yeah, well, thank you. That's that's a very kind assessment. And I think, too, if you're someone that's working one to multiple jobs at a time, I was doing two at that point and one of them being in a big firm. So a lot of hours while studying for the LSAT, I think. If you're going through all that and you aren't going to be able to pay for it or you're not going to get scholarships, you're setting yourself up for failure in a lot of ways because that's going to hang over you for the rest of your career and life in some instances. So, yeah, I couldn't agree with your guys' you know, line at the end of every podcast about not paying for law school because it is something that will weigh on you for the rest of your career. Um, I'm sure people are wondering, what are you doing now? We know you're doing the podcast, but what is mm -hmm. making up most of your day? And yeah, how did you decide to do what you're doing now? Yeah, so I, I don't know if I decided so much to do what I'm <laughs> doing now as much as I was looking for the first, you know, escape route I could find. And it happened to be legal tech. So I, um, I found a legal technology company that wanted to hire 
people within their account and sales um, department that had legal knowledge and background. And I, you know, it was the it was the thing that I could do that would get me closest to the salary I was already making. If you're a paralegal in a law firm and you've worked there long enough, you you know, you do climb the ladder in salary and it's very hard to get out of that. It's the same with being a lawyer. Once you start hitting a certain salary, getting out feels not realistic or or like a stupid thing. Um, unless you're, you're a nonprofit, that's all I'd like to say. Yeah. Just yeah. If you'd like to have an easy escape uh, and not be tied back financially yeah. by making too much money, go into nonprofit. That's true. That is true. Yeah. But it's just, I, um, I saw that opportunity. I took it. And now what I do is a lot, I work within the sales department at a legal technology company, um, but I do a lot more account management and consulting on just different services that can help with uh, completing a case or a deadline and whatnot. And, you know, I, this sounds crazy to people and I never, never, especially because when you're going into law school, I feel like you get this elitist mindset sometimes of like going into law school, you know, smarter than Mm -hmm. doing some of these jobs. It's, I get to, I get to have a life. Like I've reconnected with so many friends since getting out of law and I've gotten to do, I took an actual vacation um, this year for the first time and I didn't have to work at all. I didn't have to check my email at all. This is the first Mm -hmm. time in five years that I have taken a vacation and not worked during it. First time. So it's great. And I, I work with kind clients most of the time. I work with kind people most of the time. And I, I have some freedom. So that's what I do mostly. I also still volunteer as a paralegal um, to work on immigration or refugee docs and whatnot. But that's, that's a free time thing. So that might be a little emotionally draining, but it's you're flexible and it's kind of doing what you initially what wanted to do right with the law, like this more idealistic um, practice. Yeah, yeah, it is. And I think that there's something I think often when people are assessing whether to go to law school or to get out of, you know, legal career, it can feel like you don't want to stop doing the thing that you think has value or gives value to to people. But why do you have to be paid? to do that, you know? Why can't you do something that is better for you and your life and finances and health, and then do that on the side? There's so many opportunities to volunteer in law, and it's so much more rewarding in many aspects to me. So there are options. I think that's the thing. There's so many options out there other than going to law school and being an attorney. Hmm. But your paralegal background obviously makes some of that possible right in a way yeah if you didn't have that you wouldn't be able to do it maybe yeah but there are ways to get into that i never i didn't i don't have a degree in paralegal studies or anything of that sort i just learned throughout the job and and worked my way up so i started just as a secretary at a law office or um and you know doing that internship with no legal anything behind me at that point so you can start to get into some of those things. And as you work in them a little longer, you pick up stuff and you work your way up. But you don't always have to go to school to learn the job, I think, is something I learned along the way. So, Yeah, if someone's interested in doing this sort of, I, you know, when I think of um, legal work that's, what is it? It's this um, kind or I don't know, this more, you know, not profit motivated, but yeah. you're trying to do some sort of public service for somebody. Mm -hmm. Um, I usually think of attorneys who do their pro bono hours, right? Mm -hmm. It's like you're really getting paid some big salary (laughs) somewhere and they're, for whatever reason, encouraging their attorneys to do some pro bono hours. And that's how you get that kind of work. But what you're saying is, no, you don't have to have any connection to a law firm or anything. And so if someone wanted to pursue that and not even go to law school, how do they even start looking for these opportunities? Research. And if you're thinking about going to law school, you should be researching options, all your options before doing it because you'll get trapped. So I did just a lot of research. I spent hours and hours and hours researching online, just different avenues to getting into law or staying in the law without actually being in a traditional legal career. Um, And you find things, you find volunteer opportunities, you find people that want someone that can go, 
you know, on prison visits and take notes and you find, you know, uh, nonprofits that need just extra hands, someone to scan documents, someone to edit a document, someone to, and so on and so forth. And translators. Yes. Translators. For appointments huge, with administrative, huge. uh, you know, yeah, yeah, that's huge right now too. And so there it's just research. You just really have to get online and start researching different avenues. And I think so often we take the one that's like the, you know, front and center option instead of really digging into other things. Well, the one that also in theory pays you $200,000 a year to start, that would Mm -hmm. be good. I'd like to do that one and also work for refugees (laughs) at the same time. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And I mean, I did get to do a lot of pro bono work at the firms I was at, but I didn't, I didn't start off like that. I just started as a secretary and then started to do more with clients and, and worked, worked up from there. So there, there are lots of options and you can give as little or as much time as you want while still having a career that not only pays you fairly, but also enables you to have that time. Doesn't call you at midnight and force you to do stuff. <laughs> yeah, that was I think that Which was one of the last work moments. usually doesn't. But oh, sometimes. yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Kate, yeah. You mentioned, but they don't pay you very well. You mentioned that a couple of <laughs> times. So what? Yeah. What's your experience with nonprofit and what do you recommend? I mean, I'm not trying to horn in on that. Sorry. I'm just like, uh, no, but no. Yeah, it's, you know, the problem kind of to what Nathan just said, like, yeah, it'd be great to be able to do both, right? To have the $200,000 salary and be helping people on a regular basis. And some attorneys do do that with their, with their pro bono hours. But um, that's part of the problem is like, it takes a lot of privilege just to be able to go into nonprofit practice. Because if you've accrued all of these loans to go to law school, you are not paying them off maybe in your lifetime on a nonprofit salary, if we're being realistic, depending on where you went and how much debt you have. I have a lot of debt um, because as a transfer, I was not eligible for scholarships at Cornell. So I just had to pay. Mm. Um, And that was a lot of money. (laughs) Um, And so, but thankfully, you know, I do have support. You know, I have a spouse who has a stable, well-paying job. And so I was still able to go and take a nonprofit job that, you know, when I, when I jumped over into tech, my struggle was not about finance because it was an upgrade. Like I was getting more money automatically, Mm. um, as a JD, not practicing as an attorney than I was as a practicing attorney in nonprofit. Um, but for me, the struggle was like emotional. Um, it was that thing that Josie kind of mentioned where I was like, well, if I'm not helping people all day, every day, and it's not my job, and then also what I'm doing in my spare time, I'm a terrible human being. Mm-hmm. I don't know where that mentality came from um, or how I got it, but it was very hard for me to think about going to work for any for-profit company because my whole goal through law school once the FBI went away was I wanted to do public interest and I wanted to do nonprofit. But obviously that that burned me out. Um, but I, there are things about nonprofit that if you can afford to do it and you are in a position to be able to get out of law school and, and go into a nonprofit position that are benefits, which is a, a lot of the time it is a little more nine to five. Um, and you can kind of say at the end of the day, I'm done. You, you might have a better work-life balance and, you know, the people you work with are generally pretty kind from what I found. Um, But, you know, there are emotional tolls for sure, depending on the kind of work you're doing. Um, I will tell you doing anti-eviction homelessness prevention work in LA during a pandemic was not the most fun experience of my life. Um, It was really, really tough. Um, But, you know, obviously that's as tough as it was on me. My mentality was always like, well, but my clients have it a million times worse and they don't have a choice to walk away from it. So that was tough for me too, when I decided to leave. <clears throat> so it's, it's just two kind of different like struggles, I think, um, leaving big law versus nonprofit. I don't know if I even answered your question of what you just asked. No, me. no, it's I just rambled at you. <laughs> I, I am curious what the day to day was like 
Yeah. So I was, it was work from home and the nonprofit had kind of, they were figuring out shifting to a digital system because they were still, as a lot of nonprofits were and some still are very like they were taking handwritten notes on everything and had physical files of everything. They didn't have like a case management system or anything like that, um, which they implemented once COVID hit and they had to go remote. And so I had a Google voice number on my phone for my clients to call, but I was essentially accessible all the time. Mm -hmm. And one of the mistakes that I made very early was I let myself be accessible all of the time. Um, And I think there was almost a little bit of that law school culture of what I had heard from big law, which was that you're supposed to be. And I don't know that I was discerning enough or knowledgeable enough to know that you don't have to do that in nonprofit. (laughs) Um, That's not necessarily the expectation. But also, I was like, well, if a client is struggling and needs help at 7pm, and they're worried they're going to get kicked out of their home. And I'm what am I doing? I'm just sitting around watching TV, like, if I can answer the phone, why wouldn't I? I learned real early that was not sustainable um, because then you get stuck on the phone until much later and then you've set that standard and then you cannot walk back from that. Once you've once that client has had that access to you, it's very hard to say, OK, no, now I'm cutting it off, especially with, you know, populations that have been traumatized or have um, really horrendous like prior experiences with attorneys, especially, which many of my clients did. So day to day, I would like basically wake up, usually have a lot of voicemails. Um, Our clients were all also folks with mental health disabilities. They were varying severities, but some of them would, you know, like forget that they called me. And so they'd leave me several voicemails in a row. And that was always really stressful for me, even though I knew it wasn't, it's not the client's fault, right? Like there's nothing they can do about it. There's nothing I can do about it. Um, But it's hard not to internalize that level of stress, especially when they are very anxious about something and it feels very urgent to them and oftentimes is very urgent. And so I would basically wake up, I deal with whatever like immediate urgent things had to happen. And then I would usually be, it was mostly writing letters. Um, It was pre-eviction. So generally, and, and thankfully in Los Angeles, the eviction protections were pretty strong. That was essentially my purview was all of the COVID related law. Um, And so I new, you know, city to city, county, state, federal, what all of the eviction protections and the different layers and helped people navigate that. So I would do intakes, like some days I would be doing interviewing new clients. um, And then I was working with mental health providers to refer clients to me as well, um, who they felt needed their needed help. So it was really kind of like all over the place, as you can tell from my, the way that I'm telling it day to day, it could change and something could crop up very easily as in big law and and other practices of law, you know, like all of a sudden someone calls and it's like, oh, I thought I was fine for the next month, but I just got another eviction notice. Um, But it was a lot of arguing with landlords, both via email and on the phone. And that was really exhausting because you definitely don't see the best side of people in that work and housing authorities and like people who are supposed to be helping the people that you're trying to help who just really shut down, especially during COVID. They took not being in the office as basically an excuse to not answer any correspondence, which stank. (laughs) So yeah, it was kind of like, it was pretty nine to five once I set my boundaries up and decided that it was going to be. And then I turned off my alerts at the end of the day, but I was always stressed. I mean, like I turned my alerts off, but I was never not thinking about what was going on with my clients. And, you know, someone was already always basically an immediate risk of being homeless. And that's a very heavy thing to kind of carry around, I guess. Hmm. I am curious, was the law pretty clear? And so, like, you knew what the outcome should be, <laughs> but it was just a matter of, you know, the 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 um, the reality of you know, trying to work with people who are trying to get around that? Or was it also the law itself was unclear? You weren't exactly sure, okay, can this person be evicted under these circumstances or not? And so you're dealing with that grayness as well? Or yeah, I'm just curious. It was both. At first, the law was very unclear. It was bananas because it was left up to every. So as I said, it was like there were city protections, then LA County had its own protections. And LA County is huge. So there are a bazillion cities inside LA County, not just LA. Um, And the county had its own protections, which were like, 
sometimes better, sometimes worse, depending on the cities. And then there was there were state level protections and then there were federal level protections. So basically what I would do when I got a case is start with wherever they lived, what city they lived in, because those were usually the most extensive if they lived in a good city and then work up from there to see which layers applied to this person. It was really complicated and I don't blame any landlords for not fully understanding it. Honestly, it took me forever to parse. Um, and I, it was constantly changing. Some cities were updating, you know, their city councils were meeting every like three months and put, kicking the can down the road and extending some parts of it and then eliminating other parts of it. It was chaos. Wow. Um, so there was a lot of stuff that was constantly moving around, a lot of moving parts. So the law was not always clear, but sometimes it was very, very clear and people just didn't want to follow it. And, you know, I understood when mom and pop landlords were struggling and and they needed their rental payments to make their mortgages and their businesses were shut down. But when you saw big corporate landlords just determined to kick you know, like a woman and her kids who like all have disabilities out on the street for their, you know, like for just what is not a lot of money to a big corporate landlord. That was what was really infuriating to me Um, because I was like, it doesn't really cost you anything to let these people stay here. And it costs them everything (laughs) if you don't let them. And those were the landlords oftentimes that were just trying to get around it. And they were hiring like high priced lawyers to just fight all of this stuff um, so that they could kick as many people out and then drive up the prices on the those units. Yeah, I think I would like to hear Josie's perspective on burnout uh, in public interest work as well. Um, I mean, Kate hit on most of it, but I would also, I guess there are kind of two levels to doing um, public interest like work in my career. And that was first with the refugee law clinic. And it's, it's pretty similar in the sense that you have multiple levels of, of law that's applying to each case. And so when, you know, and I use the example, when you first enter law school or like the, the course that I got to take as an undergraduate, we're teaching international law, we're teaching refugee law, we're teaching these big overall you know, rules and and systems are in place, but we're not teaching that each country has a set of laws. Each, you know, area that you live in within that country has a set of laws. And so all of those have to kind of work together in a sense in order for something to happen. And so when you do get clients that come in and they're desperate for help and you have so many layers to go through and all they want is to be able to get their green card and start working. They just want to start working in that country. They're not asking for handouts. They're not asking for anything else. They're fine to go live on the street, to be honest, because they've been doing that most of their lives. They want to be able to work so that maybe someday they won't have to live in in that circumstance. And so for them to come in and for you to sit there and explain to them, well, you have to go through this, this, and this, and then you still may not, you know, get a green card because they just, it's, there's so many blockers and there's so much backup with timelines. You question, what the fuck am I doing? Like, what am I giving to you? How am I helping you? And that I feel like happens so often in any type of public interest work. So mm-hmm. it, it's, it's hard because while I don't love law firms. I don't love working in them all the time. Um, you know, their pro bono work, they have the resources, they have the money, they have the things behind it. So the work that you do there when it comes to public interest, like cases is going to be more gratifying in a lot of ways because you do have the resources to give to it as where if you think you're going to be able to go into public interest work like Kate did and, and like I did for a internship, you kind of have to resign yourself to the idea that you're just going to be fighting a system with not many resources. And yeah, it's going to be the loop that you're in for the rest of your life. And that's incredibly frustrating and emotionally draining and time, you know, because you, it is harder to separate yourself from the work when you're 
hear human stories of suffering and you it, it's natural i think for most people to become somewhat invested i think you become a, or at least i did i became more callous to it over time but which i didn't love about myself either <laughs> you know i'm t- I wasn't thrilled by the fact that I could hear this horrible story. And I was like, okay, well, yep, I'll get back to you. Before. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Wow. It, yeah, it's tough. just that. But then with pro bono work, what I would say, if you are getting into to a law firm and your idea is that this pro bono work is going to make it worth it, make the firm life worth it. And it's going, you're going to be able to, you know, do both of these things and give yourself to both. It's not realistic. Um, your clients, yeah. the paying clients, the billable clients, that will always take precedence. And there are always, always going to be more than enough of that that you are drowning in those cases. So when you then try to add in your pro bono work, you are not giving your best to that. You just need to get it done in some way. You just right? need like, to get it done. Like meet a certain number of pro bono yes. hours or something. And yeah. So then that mm. public interest work that you, you know, fantasized about that you're, you know, fighting for justice just becomes a box, the box that you're checking off at your review every year. And it becomes something that you give not much time to because you can't afford to with all your billables. It goes then down to your paralegal usually to pick up a lot of that slack. And it it just, it's a cycle. It's, and it's, you know, the, the paralegal is still expected to keep up with all your billables as well. So if you're not, you're not, you're not going into the law firm and then like, oh, I have all this time to fight for justice. No, you're going to have very Honestly, little like, time. <laughs> you don't even have that much time when you're in a nonprofit, even if yeah. fighting for justice is the job you're there to do. Like I was thinking before you even said that, JC, it actually mm-hmm. led really well into what I was just thinking about, which is the lack of resources. If And I don't want to discourage anyone from going into nonprofit by any means. There are so many wonderful things about it. It is fulfilling. But I just want to caution people, if you're going to just like be ready to set your boundaries up early, be ready to take an amount of money that is not what your peers in law school are going to be making by a long shot and make sure that you can afford to do that. But it's all but also be ready to be um, to drown a little bit, because I don't know that there is any nonprofit that is so well resourced. Maybe, Maybe some of the bigger ones are. But, you know, we didn't have a paralegal. We were a staff of 16 total at this nonprofit that I worked at. Um, The first nonprofit I worked at in law school, it was a staff of five. Um, We had an office manager. That's usually the sort of equivalent. But that office manager is doing everything. They are balancing the books. They are taking the intake calls. They are doing literally all of the organizational stuff where they don't have time to file your stuff for you in court. So you're going to have to do everything yourself if you are going to nonprofit, generally speaking. And that includes all of that boring stuff and the stuff that a lot of people don't love to do and that administrative stuff that gets shoved off onto paralegals and legal Mm -hmm. assistants in firms um, and in other other contexts. So you're going to and it cuts into the time that you could spend talking to people and interviewing more people. And there will be an endless stream of people that you need to help and that you want to help. Um, and you're not going to have time for them. And that is difficult to to manage as well. Um, but you've got to get all of that other nitty gritty stuff done too. And it's no fun. But also can be very rewarding. Just have your expectations set going into it. That's, I think, the key. Because I didn't have that. Do either yeah. of you have success stories that stick out that you want to share? I have... Quite a few. uh, The abortion ban cases that I worked on, those were all pro bono cases that came in. And I think we won all but one of them that I worked on. And that was really rewarding because I, you know, since the attorneys were busy, I did a lot of the work on those. And, you know, to see to see your case, especially something where you've interviewed clients or you've read their stories and they are really um extreme and the, you know, very human element to them to see, you know, your work pay off, to see those win and to see a clinic stay open for longer and a ban be reversed, you know, an actual law be reversed in, in, in a state is really cool. And it's, it's that kind of high that gives you the push to do the next one. What? So, so your client yeah. in that case was a clinic. That's It was a clinic, but then the clinic had, you know, several, um, would have several patients that then would be interviewed to share their stories to be able to give us, you know, that that extra 
umph to our argument to see what the effects of this ban actually was doing to to people. So it it was it was really rewarding in that sense. But they don't prepare you for the number of losses that you're going to see as well, and how how much those can can hit you um, when you you know spend months and I. It's not a short process. You will spend months, if not years, working on these things. And to see that amount of work then just be completely disregarded and the people that you were, you know, invested in helping shit out of luck, then that that takes the toll. So Yeah, it's interesting. I guess when you're an attorney and you lose these cases, well, how's the phrase go, right? Uh the attorneys always get paid. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, but so in that case, attorneys are a little maybe indifferent about winning or losing. But when you're talking about pro bono work or nonprofit work, right, you're not there for the money. You're not there to get a paycheck. Mm-hmm. So it is much more about the wins and the losses. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. And it's from it's resources point, yeah. that they're putting into it. You know, the firms putting in this money, we're not getting paid. So. It is, it does hit on a different, a different level. And I think too, what's so fucked up about this is that when you get into that space and you're used to billing hours for clients that can pay you this insane number for the work that you're doing. Yeah. What are the rates you, you remember? <laughs> yeah. 900 an hour? I don't know. Like crazy numbers, I've, right? I've seen 1500 an hour for, for some top partners. It's yeah. ridiculous. That's ridiculous. And <laughs> it's you see this pro bono case and you, you the human part of you is like yes i want to give to this but then when you're looking at it and you're looking at the potential loss and you're looking at the hours you put on that and you're thinking i could be billing these hours and i could have made this amount of money from this it it messes with your mind a little bit it does yeah especially when, you, when lose. you lose yeah you're like okay we could have been doing something else at least bringing home money yeah. And so mm. you can kind of see where the system and the way the career actually plays out. You slowly but surely start to lose that, you know, fight for justice, idealist mind that you have when you go into law school a lot of the time. It starts in law school, too. I mean, the law mm-hmm. schools themselves. Somebody said earlier, where does this come from, this idea that you can work for justice? And it's like, well, the schools themselves love the idea of, oh, yeah, absolutely. No, let me t- talk endlessly about our nonprofit justice. pro bono working for justice. You're going to be working for refugees and you're going to be working for the environment and you're going to be working for abortion clinics and you're going to be working for you know nothing but just justice. But mm-hmm. then the second you get into law school, they start pushing you in a totally different direction because they realize that the jobs are in a different place and they start, Mm -hmm. well, you know, these big law firms have these very prestigious pro bono. They're very committed to the idea of pro bono and what you could do instead. (laughs) So, you know, as you're in law school, Mm -hmm. because you're not you're not in the sales department anymore, which is the admissions office. The admissions Mm -hmm. office is the sales department. They're all about pro bono, justice, whatever. And then the second you're in actual (laughs) school, you have to start talking to like career services and career services Mm -hmm. is they've they know very well that, you know, refugees and the environment. Do not have money. Nope. Yeah, they're not hiring. (laughs) Yeah, no. The best advice I got early in law school was from my Civ Pro professor. And I told him, you know, I want to do at the time wanted to do FBI, but like held this in my mind when I decided on nonprofit. I always knew I didn't want to do firms. And he was like, just keep repeating that to yourself because they will try and get you to go the traditional path and go to a firm. Do not listen and just stick to your guns. And that was that was the best advice I got early in law school. It's peer pressure, too, right? Because you look to your left, look Mm -hmm. to your right. Everybody's in a suit because they're all going to OCI interviews. And it's just like, oh, yeah everybody's talking to the firms. You feel like a failure if you're not, well, I'll at least go do some interviews. I mean, what could be possibly the harm? Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, and you're already being placed in direct comparison to your peers constantly and basically being told to compare yourself to your peers because you're graded on a curve all the time. You were, there's no way to avoid that, that mentality that is so nurtured in law school. Even if you're at a good law school, I'm very grateful. I did my one year, one L year at Boulder because it was uh, much more, I think, supportive and collegial than a lot of 
law school environments that I've heard about from other people. And Cornell was pretty good on that front as well, I will say. But a lot of places, it is not like that. And even there, there was the like, oh, did you get did you get in the top 10 percent? Are you on the dean? You know, people were whispering around and trying to figure out like who was and what rank. And, you know, it's just that kind of environment fosters that competition and direct comparison to your peers from mm-hmm. the jump. And so it's very, very hard to keep yourself out of that mentality. I recommend that law students do it as much as they possibly can. Try not to compare yourself to others, but it's hard. Yeah. I think, you know, don't pay for law school. Obviously, I don't want to <laughs> I don't want to go against that that advice because I think it's it's good, but if you are determined to go to law school and you are somehow think that if paying for it, yeah, if you must. <laughs> and you somehow think paying for it is, you know, it's going to pay off later on, you're going to be able to pay off, it'll all be fine. I think um, a lot of the time, especially students that don't have the means to pay that off, um, so they don't care about the the scholarships or they have, you know, s- some support so that they can go into nonprofit. If you don't have that, your options will feel like and in some ways be only to go into big law or to a law firm that can help pay you well enough to get you to you know where you need to be and get and pay off those loans. So for people that don't have the means and don't have scholarships, you will most likely be in a big firm or a law firm after law school. Even if you think you won't be, you will be because there is no way you will survive that amount of debt and everything that comes with it if you don't go into a job out of law school that pays you a lot. This is where the schools interrupt you and they say, oh, but you know, are you familiar with the loan forgiveness program from the federal (laughs) government? Are you familiar with our very generous loan repayment assistant program that we have here at our school? Um, If anybody's interested in a lot more about those programs on episode 419 of the Thinking LSAT podcast, we discussed at length um, L raps and how they are a bit of a scam. Cornell did have one that I did take advantage of that did help me for a couple of years. I will say, um, tell you more about, but that. you know, now I'm not a nonprofit anymore. So my whole dream of <laughs> getting those forgiven is kind of like, well, that's, that's gone part of I burned what we out talked about it. so early because yeah. it's 10 years. And if you think you're going to stay, I mean, some people do, they make it in nonprofit for 10 years, but part of why they set it up that way, right. Is most people aren't going to, do that. So right. um, Which, exactly. But no, yeah. I, <laughs> we said that on the show yeah, like last week. It's, it's just so obvious. It's like, well, if they really you were can't serious be about nonprofit, then why don't they just let you go for free to law school? Right. <laughs> Instead of having this right. wildly complicated system of no, 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 you borrow the money and you sign your life away and you start making the payments. And then yeah, then after 10 years, if you're still in nonprofit and if you still qualify for the our program and if the program uh-huh. still exists then yeah you know and you're still in this county and you still have you know three pets then we will we'll let you you know get oh by the way paid off yeah it might be taxable income when that loan gets forgiven <laughs> but <laughs> oh and you better file your taxes if you're married uh separately filing separately jointly instead of jointly because uh for the repayment program through cornell it was like it, took, it if we didn't file separately it took his pay, his finances into account and I couldn't get the like repayment assistance. Uh, but then you lose the benefits of filing jointly. Right. Right. Yeah. Married, yeah. Pi- married exactly filing separately right. pays higher taxes. Exactly right. Yeah. So my extremely <laughs> low nonprofit salary did not offset his, you know, higher. Anyway, fun complications yeah. of being an adult. <laughs> it's the same in government too. I have several friends, attorneys that have been in you know government and they yeah. got into government for the same reason you know there's this loan forgiveness um program but it, again it's it's similar to nonprofit where there aren't enough resources in the office normally you don't have enough paralegals you don't have enough assistants and yep. it's not as well oiled of a machine as um firms can be and so you <laughs> You will burn out in government work too. Um, we've talked to people that have oh yeah it have burned out in government too. work, and so you don't end up you know staying yep. for the whole time and getting that forgiveness. And 
it's just it feels like a scam, to be honest. It's like they know it's not going to for most people, it's not going to work. You're not going to stay that long. And so they there they go. They've got the money. Hmm. Well, and the other thing they sell you is the thing that Josie was kind of talking about earlier is like, well, just do a firm for five years and pay off your loans and then you can switch to nonprofit. By the time you've been making a firm salary for five years, your salary switching to a nonprofit is cut in half at best. I mean, yeah, and that's, that's just hurt. not I, I and no matter how much money you're making, like that is a big thing to consider. That is tough. It, once you've, you know, started living the firm lifestyle or even if you haven't, even if you're saving smartly, like that is a big decision to take that amount of money out of your yearly income. Mm -hmm. It's so extreme that I, as a paralegal, my first year as a paralegal made more than my attorney friends that went into nonprofit. So then imagine in five years of doing that, what my salary could have been for me to go into anything else, nonprofit, whatever it is, even to yep. be a nonprofit attorney afterwards, I was looking at taking a 30K cut in my salary. That's mm -hmm. massive. That's massive. And I'm just a paralegal. So yeah. imagine yeah. me five years in a law firm as an associate, what that cut would be like. It's, in, it, it's not realistic. I don't mind being open about what I was paid. Like I, I was making 65K a year in Los Angeles as an attorney. Um, and that was competitive, highly competitive mm. for nonprofits in that area. Hmm. That's um, not a lot of money yeah. in LA in 2019. Not in LA. No. Yeah. No, the other people I knew who lived there working in nonprofits couldn't, they had to have roommates or spouses or someone like there was, they couldn't live by themselves on that salary. Yeah. <laughs> Do we even see people who work in big law? Um, I'm curious, this idea, because I do hear it from students from time to time. They're like, well, no, because I'm going to go into big law. I'm going to make $200,000. I'm going to work there for five years, three years, five years. I'm going to live like a monk while I'm in while I'm working in big law. Mm -hmm. Is that actually a thing? Do people do people ever do that? Or do people actually do all people just immediately get sucked into? No, I have to buy the Mercedes. Uh, I would say I have been in three firms at this point. One of them, a massive international firm. I've never seen anyone not drink the juice, so to speak. You know, they yeah, just you get the salary, that. you get the salary, you get the benefits, you see the life, um, you buy the thing. I, I have this one story, which I hope isn't like derailing the conversation, but I, there was a partner in one of the firms I worked at. We invited us over for a Christmas party, I think, and go. And there is this, the biggest island, like kitchen island I've ever seen in my life. It's it was literally the length of my apartment isn't saying a ton, but still. <laughs> and it was massive. And, you know, makes all this money about the thing. And I'm like, wow, this is amazing. He's like, yeah, I'm never here to enjoy it. I don't even use this. I, I, it just has sat here unused since I installed this massive, expensive thing in my home. And that's a, you know, that's a relatively dumb example. There's so many bigger things, but that's just one case in which you see this huge thing that you get to buy with all this money, but you never enjoy it. Because you're never there because mm -hmm. you never have the time. So what is the purpose of having this money and buying these things? Well, it's, just, yeah, it it's crazy, right? Well, sorry, I just have to say like never Please. yeah, enjoy it. But at the same time, it's precisely because everyone around you is buying that shit mm -hmm. that you mm. are going to. It's not even conscious, right? It's yeah. it's just like, oh, I, I need a new car. And well, I, wow. Okay, well, that's what. Oh, did you see that that Beamer? Did you see that? Tesla. Yeah, okay. keeping up with the Joneses. Like, it is not it, like it might not even be. You just don't even consider other options. Can you show yeah. up in a 2018 Corolla? Probably not. Right. Like <laughs> you're just gonna feel. So there's that. That what is that? It's just doing what your peers do. I mean, that's what they say. If yeah. you want to be successful, go hang out with successful people or something like that. Right. Because in some ways, mm -hmm. you the same thing. If you Whatever. If you want to work out more, go hang out with people who work out. You want to mm -hmm. spend money? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> go hang out with attorneys, right? Who are buying these nice yeah. suits and everything. And then there's this other thing I had to look up. It's called the consumption function. It's as your income goes up, consumption 
just mm-hmm. tracks. Yeah. And and people don't believe it. They think, oh well, you know, I'm making uh, forty five thousand a year now. Boy, if I were making ninety, I yep. Think I'd of be all the sad. money I'd save. Yeah, I'd be sad. I'd be I'd great. I'd be saving yeah. it all. And then yeah. whoa, you know, two hundred at these big firms. Oh my god, like my life is mm-hmm. taken care of. You know, they don't realize as soon as you make two hundred, boom, you're just like you're right up there, and it's so easy to get up to that level of spending. There's upfront costs too, yeah. with like suits and what i'm sorry i just interrupted you that was very no no go ahead um i when i was starting my first paralegal uh job and it was big firm dc i was going to to show up in my you know i think it was target suit or something tj maxx i don't know something just a suit it's all (laughs) i could afford in college the standard suit of the nonprofit attorney Yeah. (laughs) yeah exactly so I had this and it was just instantly I found out that you have to show up in a suit that's a brand because people will recognize it. I can't tell the difference, um, but yeah, they right. can. And so if I show up on my first day in a Target suit versus, you know, Calvin Klein or something, they're going to know. They're going to they're going to see it. And so people judge you on that. Walking to work in D.C., people are looking K Street. Nobody knows. Man, you probably yeah, yeah. Know. Well, there you go. No, no, yeah, yeah. In in nonprofit, you do not have to be a label whore. That I will say for nonprofit work. Yeah, um, you can have your goodwill suit that you like. I I think I got all my suits at secondhand because I couldn't afford to get get a brand name suit. Um, but I, you know, and I do want to say also like that, you know, I recognize that sixty five thousand dollars is a significant salary but it's just like in that context and in that spot and for the job that you're doing it's not not so much (laughs) um but you know when you think about it you're like well teachers are getting what like thirty thousand dollars a year these days i don't know but it's crazy that they in in both of those professions and, and teaching requires a ton of upfront investment too my sister's currently like in school doing all of that stuff but they count on the fact that, you know, like we said earlier, you know, you're you're doing this rewarding work. You know, you're not in it for the money, so we can get away with not paying you as much money because they know people will continue to do it because, you know, mission not money. That's what they'll they'll say. Oh, but it's like phrase, okay, but huh? people, yeah. But you know, in order to enable more people to do the mission, I'm sorry, you have to pay more money. Um, especially if you want more people who are closer to a lot of the missions and have lived experience with your mission. It's just, it's not sustainable the way it works right now. Yeah. It's a little bit of a tangent. Sorry. (laughs) No, this is all good. I think you've given, uh, our listeners a lot to think about (laughs) and a little bit more, uh, you know, peeling back the curtain of what's ahead for them. If they decide to go down this path, either of you, any, last pieces of advice that you have for students what what should they be thinking about in addition to what you've already said i would say talk to lawyers if you can shadow someone in a law firm or whatever it is that you think you want to go into post law school um do that reach out to people usually people are open to letting you do that um if you can work in a law firm, even part-time doing something, even better because you're going to get a bit more of a real image of what goes on as opposed to the what you can be fed if you're just shadowing. Um, work. Work in the law if you can because what you think it is is not what it is. And uh, it's the, probably the biggest letdown you will have is when you get out of law school and you find out what it is like on the other side and the practice of it. So work in it if you can. Um, and you know, if you're still determined to go set boundaries with clients early, if you can have, have a game plan so that you can have some semblance of peace, maybe in your evenings. I think it's not what you think is excellent universal advice for life as you know uh, (laughs) someone in their mid to late 40s 
I've had that experience so many times in my life. I don't think young people yeah. really realize this. We're we're told in high school or sometimes even before high school that we can start planning out our whole lives and picking a career path and that we somehow know what it's going to be before we get into it. But it's just not what you think. We mm -hmm. have so many um, students who want to do kindergarten straight through JD and who are so stressed out about what? No, I can't take a gap year or, oh, my God, I can't take mm. two gap years. And it, I just want to say, look, it's not what you think. Please go get a job. No. Yeah, yeah. it really is. Yeah. That and I, to, best I mean, I got. I didn't go into law school till I was in my late 20s because I did drama school first and then I did undergrad at 23. So you can mm. take it. You can take the time. And I actually feel like going to law school older really helped me because I was not that 22 year old who was like, well, I have to be in the library all night, which I think I would have been if I had gone straight through. But I was like, I have a life, you know, I do not want law school to be my life. I decided that going into it, I had much better boundaries, actually, honestly, going to law school than I wound up having once I went into practice. And I think that helped me not burn out in law school, because otherwise I probably would have. Because you had the balance then. But then once you got into practice, yes. then you were not allowed to have the balance anymore. This wasn't possible. Out the window. <laughs> well, not allowed. Honestly, it was uh, it was myself. My nonprofit was completely supportive of me, like turning my alerts off at the end of the day. I just didn't feel like I could like I didn't I felt too responsible mm. for people. Um, but, you know, if you do that to yourself, you burn out after six months like I did. And then you wind up leaving it all together. You're not helping anybody anymore. Mm -hmm. So set boundaries early, as Josie said. Your summer internship at a law firm, your summer associate. It is not anything like what you will do when you start working at the firm. Uh -huh. And nobody understands that, but they pull out all the stops, all the money, all the fun things, all Let's the go balance out to lunch. in the fucking world. <laughs> yes, they pull it all out. Your summer associateship <laughs> there will not be your work there. Just know that. It's not going to be. Garden parties, checking out the the partner's awesome kitchen island. It's like, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, the lobster so for cool. lunch every day. <laughs> it's like the only exactly. day the partner's been at home all yeah, month. Yeah. <laughs> to interview Actually, the though, intern. yeah. It's exactly how it goes. <laughs> Their spouse is asking them all the questions they don't get to ask them on a daily basis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Talk a bit. Talk a bit about the, before we let you go, um, you've been very generous with your time already, but talk a little bit about the Legal Burnouts podcast. Why did you start it? Maybe tell us about a few of your favorite episodes. Um, so we met at, we both escaped into tech at the same time. We met kind of at our like orientation for our first tech job, each of us, um, and bonded very quickly. Did you start the Spotify Started playlist shares. immediately? <laughs> yes, I was about to say <laughs> <laughs> yes, we did. Next day, actually, it was a shared Spotify playlist, which we still we've neglected a little bit. Actually, we should get back back on that. Um, and then we uh, work, as Josie always says, uh, made a mistake of sending us on a trip together to San Francisco. And um, we hosted an event together for, for work. And then we were chatting afterward and talking about all of the stuff that bothered us about the legal industry and how so many people we knew had burned out of it and were escaping, including us. And uh, someone else that was there was like, oh, you should start a podcast. And I think Josie, I said, OK. And Josie was like, well, that's a joke. Sure. And then I was like, no, we really should start a podcast. Um, You're required to we in started San talking Francisco, about a little more. to be fair. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. It's true. If you don't have a podcast in San Francisco, you're nobody. Um, <laughs> so we <laughs> started talking about it a little more kind of honed in on the idea of burnout and initially it was just going to be the two of us kind of talking to each other and then I have a connection uh wound up having a connection with a guy named Alex Sue who's big in legal tech industry um who's really fantastic and helpful guy and introduced me to a bunch of other amazing people who are also kind of legal influencers I guess you could say um who are active on social media and I kind of started pitching them the idea of being guests and everyone was like, yes, I burned out. Please let me talk about it. <laughs> I mean, the, it's it's hard to find anyone. And that's when we kind of went, oh, shoot, this is getting real. Because everyone I knew, I mean, when I got out of the law into tech, I thought I was just burning out because, you know, I didn't I never wanted to be a lawyer in the first place. I thought I was alone. I thought I couldn't hack it. 
And I suddenly stumbled upon this website that was dedicated, a business dedicated to helping lawyers leave the law. And I was like, oh, this is a problem um, in this entire industry. If people are building businesses around helping people escape this industry. Mm -hmm. Um, And I was getting messages from other people who were saying, you know, the fact that you got out inspires me to feel like I can get out someday. It was crazy. (laughs) Um, So... (laughs) We, we, and then when I was talking to Josie, she was like, yep, same and paralegals, not just attorneys. So we really wanted to represent both sides of that journey too, and talk about staff. Um, and then she has the firm experience. I have the nonprofit experience. It just felt like a good fit. And yeah, now we, we're uh, a few, we're nine, about to drop our ninth episode and it's been great. Josie, we, you want to talk about some of your favorites? Or anything. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm a pretty background person. So this whole thing has been fairly uncomfortable for me, but it's been rewarding. It has been rewarding. I was I was very uncomfortable at first, but it's it is really rewarding. And, and the conversations have been great and opportunities. So it, it's worked out. But um, I think I think one of my favorite episodes is probably I think it's our third episode with um, Matt CJ. Margulies. Oh, when yeah. is Matt's? Sorry. Is it third? <laughs> Shit. Matt's was. <laughs> I don't know our podcast. <laughs> Matt Margolis. There's an episode with Matt Mar- Mar- Margolis. And <laughs> he's great. And he had several sections of burnout. He talks about firm and then he talks about government burnout and then um, in-house legal burnout. And he was an attorney throughout all of those and the different ways in which it wasn't what you think it's going to be. It's not be. what you think. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. and to burned out. So. That's one of my favorites. Um, and then we also have an episode with, uh, it's our second episode with Tom Stevenson, where it's focused on the paralegal journey a bit more. And I found that really helpful because it was somewhat similar in that, you know, he went into the work before law school because he just wasn't sure that was the right path for him as well. And, you know, ended up at a similar similar place that I, I did when I left. So, um, yeah. It's it's been rewarding. It's cool. What what are the best ways for people to get in contact with you? You obviously have the podcast, the legal burnouts. Yeah, we are both on LinkedIn mm-hmm. <laughs> um, under our own names, <clears throat> and then I'm on Instagram and TikTok um, at Bridal Party of Five. If you want to give me a follow, and the legal burnouts is also uh, on Instagram and TikTok. <laughs> yeah, okay. and I'm. Also have an, an Instagram for it, though I'm not super good at checking social media sometimes. <laughs> so LinkedIn is probably the best way to get in contact with me. I'm, I'm, pr- I'm on there fairly yeah. often. Okay. And people can honestly feel free to message us. I mean, <clears throat> the whole reason we started this podcast was to help people. You know, that moment for me of finding that website was so affirming and really validating that I was not alone in that feeling. That is just what I wanted to give to other people. And what is our goal is to, you know, to help other people feel less alone and to hear people's stories. Some of them have reached out to tell their stories of burnout for the first time to us. And um, please, we are both very open to to talking to people. So feel free to. Well, we're not in law anymore, so we have time to talk to (laughs) people. That's right. (laughs) That's right. So, you know, yeah, I'm always open to talk to especially potential law students um, kind of about what the other side can look like and, and the process. So, yeah. All right. Well, great. Well, thank thank you both. That was uh, Kate Bridal and Josie Hoff. You guys are uh, have lots of wisdom to share with everyone, <laughs> especially for those who are considering this field. So thanks again for coming on. Nathan, did you have any last questions or comments? No, nice to meet you both. I gave you both a follow on LinkedIn. Uh, that's the only. Oh, thank I don't you. Even do anything on it, but I, um, I also <laughs> people can reach out to me. I mean, it is like <laughs> there for professional, you know, networking. And if people want to ask questions, it's always a great place to reach lawyer types. So mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah. Now I feel sure. all pressured. I better say you can reach out to me on LinkedIn as well. <laughs> I didn't say I'll respond. I just never said, get <laughs> more. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I have learned in this, like, now that I'm doing more content creatory stuff, you are not obligated to give any more of yourself than you want to give to anybody. So, if sure. Ben, if you don't want to say, no, reach out, no, no, it's okay. Draw yeah. a boundary. We're all about boundaries <laughs> for legal burnouts. No, no. <laughs> yeah, it was really great to meet both of you. I've been listening to the podcast yeah, this for is great. years. So, um, it's great to, great to chat with you guys. Thanks yeah, for having cool. us on. Yeah, thanks for having us on.
Yeah, for sure. If you want to be LSAT famous, please ask us questions or share news with us at thinkinglsat.com. If you have questions about the LSAT demon, you can email the world's best help team. That's help at lsatdemon.com. You can also check out our other podcast, LSAT Demon Daily. And of course, now the legal burnouts. That was episode 200, uh, sorry, not 200, 420 of the Thinking Outside podcast. Thanks all y'all for listening. Nice knowing you. Don't pay for law school.